Mid-20th century data showed income distribution among blacks in the country as a whole to be slightly more unequal than among whites. So did later data. A 1966 study indicated that among the more than 4 million black American families at that time, just 5.2 thousand families produced all the black physicians, dentists, lawyers, and academic doctorates in the country. Despite how exceptional such occupations and achievements were among blacks at that time, these particular families averaged 2.25 individuals each in those categories. That is, every four such families averaged nine individuals at these levels. Awareness of such social differences was both widespread and often acute within the black population. There is a whole literature on exclusive black elites, including such books as Aristocrats of Color by Willard B. Gatewood, Our Kind of People by Lawrence Otis Graham, and Certain People by Stephen Birmingham. Particular upscale neighborhoods within mid-20th century Harlem were known as Strivers Row and Sugar Hill. A luxury apartment building at 409 Edgecombe Avenue was so widely known as a residence of the black elite that it was said to be sufficient to get into a taxi in Harlem and say simply 409 for the driver to know where to take you. Similar patterns existed in Chicago. There had long been a small black community in Chicago in the 19th century, before the great migrations of blacks from the South in the 20th century led to several fold increases in the number of blacks in that city. Those blacks born and bred in 19th century Chicago, and living as small enclaves of blacks in an overwhelmingly white population, had over time assimilated culturally to the norms of the surrounding society, as other groups have in similar circumstances. The later massive migrations of southern blacks to Chicago in the 20th century created acute polarization within the black community there. The Chicago Defender, a black newspaper, was highly critical of the newcomers for behavior that gave blacks in general a bad name. So were other blacks from the pre-existing black community there and in other northern cities, where both the existing black residents and the local black press denounced the new arrivals from the South as vulgar, rowdy, unwashed, and criminal. Like other black newspapers in other northern communities, the Chicago Defender published many admonitions to Southern blacks arriving in Chicago, including don't use vile language in public places, don't allow yourself to be drawn into street brawls, don't take the part of lawbreakers, be they men, women, or children, and don't abuse or violate the confidence of those who give you employment. As with other racial or ethnic groups in other times and places, Blacks in these northern communities feared that the arrival of less assimilated members of their own race would provoke negative reactions in the larger society that would not only jeopardize the progress of their race, but would even threaten retrogressions as the larger society turned against blacks in general. These fears as to how the new black arrivals from the South would behave and how the local white population would react against blacks in general both turned out to be all too well-founded. A study in early 20th century Pennsylvania, for example, showed that the rate of violent crimes among black migrants from the South was nearly five times the rate of such crimes by blacks born in Pennsylvania. The South had long been the country's most violent region, among blacks and whites alike. Negative reactions from northern whites set in, as feared, and affected blacks in many ways. Some northern communities where black children had for years been going to the same schools as white children now began to impose racial segregation in the schools. In Washington, blacks were no longer allowed in many white theaters, restaurants, or hotels, and their opportunities to work in white-collar occupations shrank. There were similar trends in Cleveland and Chicago, among other places. Oberlin College and Harvard, where black students had lived in dormitories with white students before, now excluded black students from their dormitories. As these retrogressions set in, in northern cities, black civic organizations, such as the Urban League, sought to assimilate the newcomers to existing norms of behavior, just as civic and religious organizations among the Irish and the Jews did earlier, in order to get Irish and Jewish immigrants assimilated to American cultural standards. The conclusion that the widespread retrogressions in racial opportunities open to blacks in northern cities in the early 20th century was, 
were a result of the massive migration of less acculturated southern blacks to those communities, is reinforced by the history of the mass migration of southern blacks to the Pacific coast decades later. In the 1940s, during World War II, industries producing military equipment and supplies on the Pacific coast attracted vast numbers of blacks and whites from the south. Henry Kaiser's huge shipyard in Richmond, California, alone employed more than 90,000 people, and there were similar war industries in other West Coast communities. As among northern cities in the 19th century, blacks were a very small percentage of the population on the Pacific coast before these mass migrations from the south, and were correspondingly more acculturated to the behavioral norms of the surrounding society than were southern blacks arriving there. Prior to the 1940s, racial discrimination was not on the same scale on the Pacific coast as in the South, or as in northeastern cities after the great migrations there from the South. In San Francisco, black children went to schools that were not racially segregated, and the small black population lived in neighborhoods with whites, Chinese, and other races. The great migrations of blacks out of the South that reached the northeastern and midwestern cities around the time of the First World War reached the Pacific coast decades later, during the Second World War. During the 1940s, more than four-fifths of the blacks who arrived in the San Francisco Bay Area shipyards came from the South, usually the less educated Deep South. The new black arrivals were overwhelmingly more numerous than the existing black population. In Richmond, California, for example, there were only 270 black residents in 1940, but the Kaiser Industries brought in more than 10,000. The black population of Berkeley in the 1950 census was nearly four times what it had been in the 1940 census, before the United States was at war. Over that same span of time, the black population of Oakland rose to more than five times what it had been before, and that of San Francisco rose to approximately nine times its 1940 level. As in the northern cities earlier in the 20th century, the new black arrivals on the West Coast were seen by the existing black population there as vulgar and ill-behaved, and, as in northern cities decades earlier, the arrival of the newcomers was followed by retrogressions in black-white relations.